It's Tuesday, December 5th, 2023. My name is Ashton Ellett, here with another installment of the Senate Staff Oral History Project, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. I'm here today in Avondale Estates at the home of Mr. Scott Maxwell. A native, a native of Oglethorpe County, Georgia, Mr. Maxwell earned his undergraduate degree in journalism from the University of Georgia's Grady School. After graduating from UGA, he worked for his father at the Oglethorpe Echo before joining the Small Business Administration's Communications Department in the twilight days of the Carter Administration. After returning to Georgia, Mr. Maxwell served as the reading clerk for the Georgia State Senate during the 1981 legislative session. He went on to join Congressman Bo Ginn's gubernatorial campaign as Deputy Press Secretary in the spring of 1982. Later that year, he joined the staff of Senator Sam Nunn, first as a field representative and later as press secretary. Following his time in Washington, Mr. Maxwell returned to Georgia as director of marketing for Piedmont Impressions Greater Georgia Printers, and since 1997, he has been principal at the government affairs and consulting firm of Matthews and Maxwell and a partner with Government Solutions LLC. So, Mr. Maxwell, Scott, thank you so much for for having us here to talk about your work in the Senate, uh, your time with Senator Nunn, and uh, your 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 career in and out of government. Glad to be with you. It is it is appreciated, and somebody who grew up right next door to Athens, Georgia. So that's a that that's a refreshing uh, uh, you know bit of the conversation that we don't usually get to have, or yeah. fo- folks who are from from and around the environs of of Athens, Georgia. So tell me about your, uh, your, your, your childhood, growing up a little bit in, uh, in Crawford. Sure. Well, it's surprising to many to know that I was born in Newport, Rhode Island, because uh, my dad was a career Navy guy, and mm-hmm. he was in the last couple of years of his service. And, uh, but I came to Georgia when I was about three years old and lived in Atlanta for six months while my dad went to linotype school mm-hmm. to shift from being an engineer in the Navy and teaching in Rhode Island, he actually taught uh, foreign officers a lot from okay. other countries as well as U.S., but he, he did a lot of teaching of officers that came to the U.S. to learn how ships ran. Mm-hmm. And uh, he came, moved the family to Atlanta, and went to Macon to learn the linotype, how to operate a hot metal linotype. And then moved, uh, we moved to Crawford, which is three miles from Lexington, where his uncle's newspaper, the Oglethorpe Pecco, was located. And the plan was for him to learn the business. He learned how to run a linotype. That was the main thing, mm-hmm. the production mode. Learned the business from his uncle and eventually buy it from him and take over. Well, two weeks into that experience, his uncle died of a heart attack. So there he was, a former chief engineer in the Navy, trying to be the chief engineer for a weekly newspaper, and there's a good bit of difference. Uh, <laughs> a little bit. So, uh, but growing up was great. You know, my dad ran the local newspaper. It was not a big income thing because there's very little retail in Oglethorpe County to sell ads for. Uh, and my mother was school teacher and then curriculum director at her neighboring county and eventually became principal of the elementary school and got her, mm. got her doctorate degree and everything kind of on the side as we were growing up. Mm-hmm. So it, it was interesting. The other interesting part of it is that my mother's, who was a naturalized citizen because her parents were English Scottish. Oh, okay. Her dad, her her father was building a golf course in Florence, Italy, when she was born. So when they came to the U.S., he to be a golf pro for the Rockefellers up in New York, who had their own golf club. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, he came over in 1929, just before the Depression hit, and even the Rockefellers Golf Club closed down. But getting off track a little bit there, she lived in the house with us, my grandmother, Mm -hmm. and I have a different, I grew up with a slightly different uh, perspective, I'll say, because she was very English, Mm -hmm. and when John Wayne came on at the latest war movie and is winning it for the Americans, the good guys and stuff, she would sit in the, the chair and say, the Americans couldn't even get ready to fight. England had to hold them off for three years before the Americans can get ready to fight. What are they making him the hero for? <laughs> so it was a little different than Johnny Reb neighbors that, that I just had this constant influence of uh, her family of steamship captains and golf professionals. Her, her father-in-law won the British Open 
uh, before the turn of the century, back in the late 1800s. So uh, I had a, <laughs> a slightly different perspective growing up, but having a dad in the newspaper business mm-hmm. kind of kept you attuned to public affairs. Right. You, you just, it was at the dinner table, whether or not it was intended to be in the dinner table, whatever happened mm-hmm. would, would come up. Fire trucks and ambulances attracted our attention because that, that news was happening, and it wasn't like he had a reporting staff he could call and send out. <laughs> he he was he mo, he wrote most of the stories while typing at a line of type. You think a typewriter's bad? Put it in hot metal and then have to correct it. Uh, and then of course uh, there were there were four of us who grew up, and my brothers and I especially worked at the newspaper which was also a printing office right. when you weren't getting the newspaper out. So I would have a hand-fed envelope press. I would do this, 5,000 envelopes, 10,000 envelopes. You just turn the radio up, hope you get some good beat and, and go. But I started running that press. I was standing on a stool. OSHA would have gone off the deep end. Uh, but I stood on a shoulder and, and fed a, an envelope press that just came back and forth like this and printed return address for the bank and that kind of thing. For the record, you still have all 10 fingers. I still have all my fingers. I, I never got flattened. I did destroy some envelopes in my career. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, I, I think that, that comes with the territory. <laughs> so, tell me, you, you, went to, you went to school. A lot, of, a lot of folks who, you know, their parents are come from a, a certain line of work. Uh, the kids are saying, I don't want to mm-hmm. go into that. You went to UGA. Did you always plan to, to go to the Grady School, or is no, that just I, something I, you sort of... My, my freshman year, I actually went to East Tennessee, East Tennessee State University okay, yeah. uh, to John- play football. Johnsonville, Tennessee? Uh, Johnson City. Johnson City, that's Johnson it. Johnson City, Tennessee. And uh, that the uh, it was one of those good life experiences where the team went 0-9-1. Can you imagine how much fun it was on Mondays when you you were, you were an old nine and one football team? No, no. And uh, the, I, I was and I was a walk on. My high school principal called a, a coach that he had coached with in high school who was at East Tennessee and said, "Give this guy a shot." And uh, <laughs> so I went, and you know it. It uh, I didn't go back next year. So then I tr- I transferred to uh, UGA. Mm-hmm. And basically, I didn't have that life's dream, this is what I want to be. I had decided I did not want to be a high school football coach. Nothing wrong with high school football coaches, but to me, that was an all-the-time job that that I wasn't anxious to to pursue. And um, my dad was running the newspaper, and I thought I, I had worked with him all my life except the year I was in Tennessee. And I was probably going to be working to, to help at the newspaper because the family needed help. I figured I might as well learn how you're supposed to do it. Again, my, my dad was a chief engineer on a destroyer, kind of his background for running a newspaper and being an editor. So I basically decided to, to uh, major in journalism mm-hmm. so I could help out at the newspaper till I figured out what I wanted to do in life. So, so that's what you did? You got your, you got your degree? And then went back to work at the newspaper? Then I went full-time at the newspaper after I, I got my degree. And that, that lasted about four years. But it, it was pretty intense because I was the reporter and writer and everything. And I went to every board education meeting, every county commissioner meeting, almost every sports event, mm-hmm. uh, missing some, but certainly all the football games and most of the basketball games mm-hmm. and some of the track meets and... Uh, so again, I was in the community a lot and exposed to you know all the stories, bank robberies, and, and everything else that happens even in a small community. Did a lot of bank robberies happen? Well, I didn't, occur- didn't, didn't a lot, but one day I was <laughs> driving home. I guess I was still in school driving through Crawford, and there was a body laying in the parking lot at the bank right next to the street, and I pull over, and the guy had tried to rob the bank and gone in. And a guy in the bank pulled out a gun and shot him, and he staggered outside and collapsed and died in the parking lot. And that's about what time I drove up. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> I guess that would be an it, indelible it, memory. <laughs> he, he he was twenty feet from U.S. Highway seventy eight. I mean, he was the bank was right on the highway. Yeah, and he yeah came I know exactly where, you know where yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, at that time, the bank 
door open to the highway. Right. So it, it was it, the front door was so far from from the highway, and he didn't make it to his getaway car. Well, that's, I guess that uh, let that be a lesson to bank robbers in Crawford. <laughs> in Crawford, that's right. So, so how how did you get hooked up with with Chuck Searcy and, and the Small Business Administration, and and, and how did well, that happen? Well. How that happened is Chuck Searcy was with the Athens Observer, mm -hmm. which was an upstart newspaper competing with the Athens Morris Communications mm -hmm. newspaper uh, uh, group. And uh, Chuck and, and Pete and Don Nelson and, mm -hmm. and the whole group uh, came down to see if we could print at Greater Georgia Printers, if they could print their newspaper there because Greater Georgia Printers was managed by my dad, but were partners of area weekly newspapers, were partners mm -hmm. in Greater Georgia Printers, Inc., which was founded to print weekly newspapers when we shifted from letterpress to offset. I mean, I didn't mention earlier that the other thing, when I wasn't running a printing press, I was setting hand type, just like Ben Franklin, one letter at a time on a stool in the corner until I was about uh, 10th or 11th grade. And then we made the shift gradually, I think 1969, we made the shift to offset. And uh, What's the difference? Okay. Well, Pretend it, I don't know anything okay, about typeset. Letterpress is basically raised letters. You have a liner type with, that sets a slug with a line of type on it, and then you have another slug of hot metal, mm -hmm. and then you have individual letters for headlines, grocery ads, big type. Okay. You have very much what you saw Ben Franklin do, one letter at a time, you put it in what's called a stick, mm -hmm. you get it tight with little spacers, and that's how you made a headline. So you, on the printing press, you, you had something that was this high. Okay. Uh, and, and it was, you know, uh, metal, slugs, and individual pieces of type put together. Offset, you take a picture, and, and it's like a copier machine. Okay. Uh, it, it, everything's flat. You set copy, comes out a piece of paper, you paste it onto a layout page, okay. and you take a picture of it, as opposed to having raised type that went through a press. Gotcha. Uh, and, and okay. It. Okay. So, uh, anyway, I guess I got off track a little bit there, but the <laughs> the meeting Chuck Searcy, it was they brought their newspaper down to print at Greater Georgia Printers, mm -hmm. and so that's how we got to know them. And, you know, they would, they would put out a newspaper and they had a lot of inserts and they'd bring 10 or 15 people in cars and vans down to Crawford and insert all their newspapers in the shop and stuff. And we just got to, to know the, the whole crowd, including Chuck. Mm -hmm. So later, when Chuck went with the Carter administration to Washington and he was in charge of communications department, I don't know exactly what his title was, but... He ran the communication department for the U.S. Small Business Administration, and he offered me a job to be a disaster public information officer. So that job was to work in disaster areas and be the public information person who let people know you are eligible for loans, and it sounds like it would be just businesses. At that time, because SBA was in the loan business, mm -hmm. they were assigned to make loans to people who lost their homes in a hurricane or oh, a tornado. Okay. So you can imagine the communication is, hi, I'm from the U.S. Small Business Administration and I want to help you get a loan for the home you lost. It, it, it took some explaining. Yes, right. So, uh, but anyway, Chuck hired me for that. I was one of five in the country. I was assigned to the New England area. I had 13 states. And one of the best gigs I ever had was when I first went to work there, my job was to get a government car and start in Boston and drive to the 13 state capitals in the Northeast United States and say, hi, I'm Scott and I'm going to be your disaster PIO. Now, I wasn't always well received because they had their own, each district had their own, which meant state, mm -hmm. had their own public information officer who, if we have a disaster, we'll just use him. But anyway... That was just one of the things I had to overcome, but it was it was great just to travel around New England and that be your job. Well, and it gave you a chance to show off your Rhode Island accent. Well, I think I'd long ago lost my Rhode Island <laughs> accent, but it did give me a chance to go to Rhode Island yeah. for, my, for the second time in my life. That's so. Right. so you you were you did that for about a year or so. So so that lasted un, until Ronald Reagan won the presidential race, sure. and then we were section, whatever you call people who were just, you know, hired for that. I wasn't a permanent employee mm -hmm. as I was along 
as I, I was an appointee. Right. So when you shift administrations, the appointees go away and the new guy gets to make his appointees. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, Reagan wouldn't have kept us, but he didn't, he, he just did away with the public information program. He didn't do away with the loans and everything. Just, they didn't hire anybody to tell people about it. Well, yeah, that's one way to do it. But anyway, <laughs> um, so that's, that's how I ended up at SBA. It lasted for a year. And you came, you came back to, to Georgia, and uh, is, is this where you, you, you went to the state capitol? Uh, yes, this is where, uh, because Hamilton McCorda Jr. was mm -hmm. from Oglethorpe County. Yes, and he, the highway he, name, the 78th he, he, name after yeah. got his name on the side. He and my dad, of course, were friends, not exactly the same age, but, you know, r roughly uh, elderly, more elderly, and uh, he was secretary of the state senate. Forever. <laughs> so, for, as was his father was a state senator. But anyway, uh, his, uh, and his picture hangs in the Secretary of the State's office now. But anyway, he hired me to be the reading clerk for the 1981 session of the General Assembly in the Senate. So, basically, he was, when we're in session, I want you to be up here on the, the dais mm -hmm. and be able to make announcements and stuff. So, I, I, would, I had a little chair that I sat at. And when I spoke, of course, I stood up and spoke into the microphone, but I was, you know, two arms lengths from Zill Miller, who was a lieutenant governor mm -hmm. presiding over the Senate. And talk about getting a political education in a hurry, uh, hearing some of the background music, so to speak, that went <laughs> on when, when Zell Miller, because as we all know, he was quite fiery uh, and, and could be and, and didn't, with, didn't hold back when he was talking to people. You know, not only to the microphone, but talking mm -hmm. to people over his shoulder and elbow who were coming up to discuss the, the political nature of what they were discussing. So you, you sat up there and you could look over when, when, when uh, Lieutenant Gummery come up his little spiral staircase from his, from his office on the, the third floor and sneak it we, onto the floor. We, we, we uh, yeah, I, I mean, basically there were times it was boring, but most of the time it was very interesting. You had orators like Roy Barnes, mm -hmm. uh, who was the one person who could change my mind when if I just, you know, I read bills, that's what, what I did. So I read bills and you kind of think, yeah, I could support that or no, I wouldn't support that. The one guy who could change my mind through his oration was, was Roy Barnes. <laughs> and well, I won't say the only guy, but he, he, was the, he, he was outstanding as an orator and a debater on the Senate floor. And of course he later became governor. Oh yeah, yeah. So I guess you know, Paul Coverdell would have been the, the, the minority leader. The, 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 he had a, a great cast. Wayne Garner was a real young guy. You know, yeah. he later went on to be at uh, the corrections department yep. and, and that kind of stuff. There were, there were a number of personalities who, who uh, you know, went on to other things and then and some just would burn out and yeah. so forth. But so, so t tell me how you, you uh, parlayed that, all that experience into to political campaigns, your, your, your first work on a political campaign. Well, the, the most enticing thing about a political campaign was not having a job and needing one, and that sounded interesting. <laughs> so, so I had a, a friend of mine from college, Elaine Bunn, mm. who, you know, she, uh, I don't know why she hung out with us because she was valedictorian when she graduated. Uh, but anyway, she, uh, she moved to Washington and uh, was an expert on nuclear weapons and stuff. Okay. But she had a friend named Bob Hurt, and I would go to visit Elaine in Washington and her husband Joe Ballou, and Joe worked for Congressman Doug Bernard. Mm-hmm. And uh, Bob Hurt worked for Bo Ginn, and I just, I visited enough that, you know, they, they met me and knew me and that kind of thing. And so Elaine, I think, called Bob one time and said, Bob, why don't you let Scott work in the Ginn campaign? And uh, so that's, that's how I got the gig. And, of course, you know, I say a job. I was getting paid $10 a day. Ooh. Now, this, this was back in 82, which $10 a day, you know, you could you could get a cheeseburger meal for ten dollars a day, but they they had a uh, uh, a condo donated to the campaign, and it was stripped bare. But it was you know a place where a staff guy that was getting paid ten dollars a day could sleep. It had a, had a mattress in there, you know, you know three or four inches thick, and I 
I had a friend come by at one time to pick me up and going somewhere. And he said, my God, Scott, you sleep on a piece of Melba toast. <laughs> and <laughs> that's, that's one of my favorite stories from the campaign because, you know, you just, you, you're young, you're in an exciting campaign, you're working for a guy who's running for governor, and you sleep on a piece of Melba toast. Uh, <laughs> but you, you meet a lot of people and you make a lot of friends and uh, that kind of thing. So I got involved with the campaign just because I, I wasn't working. And the, uh, the had friends who set me up. Mm -hmm. During the campaign, I met uh, a, a lady named Trisha Rogers who had been on Nunn's staff but was now working on the Ginn campaign. Okay. And she knew about an opening for a field rep position uh, that on, on Nunn's staff, told me about it, set up an interview with the state director. And Do you remember who the state director was? Zeta Johnson, Z-A-D-A oh, yeah. -A Johnson. And... Um, she, we, we basically did interviews and talked a little bit and I guess she checked me out and whatever. Uh, but she, uh, we, we came to an agreement since I was in the middle of a campaign that I would be allowed to finish the campaign. But when it was over, whether again, was, became governor or did not, I would go to work for Senator Nunn as his North Georgia field rep. And that was Dalton, Rome the, area? It, it was, uh, 31 counties in... Oof in North Georgia, there was an existing office in Gainesville, and my primary assignment was to open a new office in Rome. So I would be juggling two offices, but the field rep doesn't really spend time in the office. We'd have uh, young high schoolers who would be on a program where they got out at noon. The office would open at noon until four o'clock mm -hmm. for people to come in to the office. But Phil Rep's job was to be out and, and visiting Rotary Clubs and, and going to see key supporters and county commissioners and right. city council people, people that, you know, just expand uh, the, the, the effort to assist uh, constituents back home, whoever might be in a position to do that. You, the field Rep needed to know them. They needed to know none. Had a field rep needed to get visits and that kind of thing. So it was mostly on the road. So uh, what was the, 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 the line of communication like? Would you pass all your information to the state director and that would go up to Washington? We, or we, did in you... the form of weekly reports. Okay. Uh, so, so we did a weekly report every week and sent it to the state director mm. who reviewed it, called if there were questions or uh, sure. why didn't you do this, <laughs> you list it it, it, it kind of had a, a format, I guess. It listed the uh, number of counties. I think we did it by county, not city. Number of counties you had visited that week, and uh, and then basically, but reported what what we thought Senator Nunn needed to know. Mm -hmm. So that that was the communication, and. Apparently, I did it well enough because Nunn and I were on a small airplane needed me knee in, in two seats one night and he basically said he, he liked my reports and was I interested in coming to Washington sometime. So it was, you know, it was uh, the, the journalism and English yeah. major ch training that I think got me from out of being somebody who just drove around North Georgia to somebody who was working in Washington. Well, tell me what that transition was like. You were going back to so well, no, you were, no. you weren't based in Washington. This is your first time. Yeah, tell me what that transition was like going from Crawford and and Rome to to Washington D.C. Well, you know, Washington D.C. is an exciting place. I love the monuments. I still love the monuments. I love the museums. Uh, and it, it was an exciting place to be, and you felt like you're doing something important that really mattered. So the the but I had visited Washington in a good bit. And mm -hmm. again, I had worked for the U.S. Small Business Administration that I didn't work in Washington because I was in New England, but I was, I went to Washington a few times. Mm -hmm. I would visit my friends in Washington. So, and, and in visiting those friends, they all worked in government. They all were all Hill staffers or Pentagon staffers, mm -hmm. as Lang was. Uh, and so, you know, there was, there was, maybe an easier transition than somebody that woke up in Crawford, Georgia one morning and then went to Washington. So, uh, again, I, I, I went to Washington some when I was a field rep, not on a regular basis, but I, I went up there for a few weeks, probably two, two and a half weeks, 
to learn how the Washington office worked mm -hmm. and get a feel for it so I was better capable of being a field rep, knowing what was going on, knowing who, who I'd have to talk to, meeting the people that I right. would call with constituent issues, that kind of thing. Now, did you live in the district when you moved there, or, or did you commute? I, when, I, when, I, when I first did, I lived uh, in the Eastern Market area mm -hmm. that is behind the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. more or less east of the Supreme Court. And over years, I gradually moved further out. Okay. But, <laughs> yeah. So you know, tell me what it was like. What was Senator Nunn like when you, when you first met Senator Nunn in 1982? How would you describe him, his, his style, his demeanor, his politics? He, he was, he, uh, how do I want to say that? Easy, the word easy comes to man. He's, he's easy, comfortable with people. Hmm. Uh, he's, he's not gregarious, but, but he's comfortable, he's self-assured, and he's not, you know, worried about what I'm going to say or whatever. He's, he's comfortable mm. with people. So, so when I met him, uh, I was opening the, the Rome office and so forth, and uh, he, he was easy to, to talk to, and, and he asked a lot of questions. Senator Nunn, Never, never shied away from asking a dumb question. Mm. He might ask a question that people th dumb, but but once he got the answer, he wasn't dumb anymore. He knew the answer. Where some of us might, uh, you know, hedge on something like that. He wanted to know what he didn't know. Right. Uh, so he was extremely uh, curious, ask penetrating questions. And later, when I got to Washington. I would give him something that I thought I'd really worked hard on and prepared and stuff, and he would send it back, and you know, in the margins, questions, questions. What about this? Did you talk to so and so? What about this? Uh, and uh, so I got a real education working for Senator Nunn, more than in in college, I think, <laughs> of how to be professional, how to be thorough, how to be in depth, uh, and and I I just I, I value that today. I think it. That certainly helped me when I came back and have my own business yeah. lobbying stuff. I still think one of our strong suits of, of Matthews and Maxwell Incorporated is communicating with clients and explaining to them what's going on in the legislature, what happened at that committee meeting, mm -hmm. why it's important, what are the details and stuff. That is something that uh, I thought I was a, a, a smart journalism student, graduate or whatever, but I learned an awful lot more working for Senator Nunn himself uh, because he, he was the best editor I ever had. <laughs> and not that he was changing my grammar as, did you ask this? Did right. you talk to somebody? You know, I'll quote three people here, what their position was. Well, what about so-and-so? Well, there were four people I should have talked to. <laughs> Apparently. So, so uh, uh, I, I, it, was, it was a great education and a great experience. And... Uh, he, he was, he was very self-assured and self-confident without being cocky and, and arrogant. Right. Uh, because he, he, I think in his own mind, he always thought, well, there's something I don't know. And, and he, he dug till he just about got it all, but he always thought there might be something I don't know. So right. don't, don't be, no time to be arrogant. And, and again, he, he was a statesman. You say what you want to about politicians, he was a statesman. He was a better statesman probably than a politician uh, because, I mean, I remember when he said, well, I'm not going to go to Iowa and flip pancakes. I mean, how does that help anything? And, I mean, so that that might have been good for <laughs> people behind the camera, but but it wasn't, it, it didn't advance the ball of statesmanship in, in America role in the world. Right. And, and so why, why would I go to Iowa and get photographs flipping pancakes? Well, that certainly, you know, skipping ahead of it, that certainly gives some insight into why, why, why the senator chose not to run for president in 1988. I, I, think, it had, I think it had something to do with it. Uh, well, when, you, when you got to Washington, what was your, what was your first job title? What were, what were your, I was, your responsibilities? I was, I was deputy press secretary. And you so, worked for role, or, or No, reporter? I worked for Ed Nagy. Ed Nagy, okay, so, okay. Roland had, had moved up to the AA position. Or right. Chief of staff is what it is and what they call it now. Because but, Richard Ray had left yeah. to run for Congress. So, I got but, you. But Roland, back in the day, we called it AA. Right. Uh, but it was really chief of staff as a job. Well, t tell me, tell me about, about, about Ed and, and, and what the press shop was like for 
the senator at that time who would have been uh, in his second second full term, yeah. uh, but also in the minority party in, right. in the Senate. So this so, wasn't Chairman Nunn, so, as we would know yeah, the, later. The, this was, you know, the 83, 84, 85 period when I was Deputy Press Secretary. Mm -hmm. So uh, Ed, Ed Nagy was this... Uh, really smart guy who was working on his PhD and had done everything but his dissertation, but he just didn't, you know, being press secretary for the United States Senator, there's not a lot of time to work on your dissertation. There is not. And, and I think Ed just kept putting it off and stuff. But he was, uh, he, he was a very good guy and, and thought in deep uh, political uh, terms, and, and I don't mean so much politics, is he understood hist history. He studied mm -hmm. history a lot and, and knew history and could see patterns that repeated themselves and, and that kind of thing. Uh, delightful guy, good writer, uh, and he went, he left in uh, 1986, if I get my years right, and went to be the chief of staff for Congressman Valentine from North Carolina. Mm. So he took a job as, as the chief of staff, and that left an, an opening. So sometimes you just got to be in the right place at the right time. <laughs> right. I, that does seem to be a, a, a trend in, in these interviews. That uh, that knowing Bob Hurt and Earl Leonard will never go wrong that's, in, in that's Georgia true. politics. That's, that's, right. that's my that's my takeaway yeah, <laughs> anyway yeah. from a lot of these yeah. interviews. Correct. But uh, what, what was the, what was the the day to day in the office like? You know, some senators' uh, offices are very. Uh, Tense, buttoned up. Others are more well, loosey goosey. Well, uh, I guess there's a lot of things to say. A couple of them. One, we referred to sooner to none as sooner to none. You know, now it's a big thing. Call them by their first name. A lot of them say, "Just call me by my first name." I, I'm, I'm old fashioned, I guess, but I think once you become a U.S. senator, there's a certain amount of respect that is due and should be issued. Part of that problem is the way U.S. senators behave today. You might be more inclined to call them by their first name. Or worse. Or, or, or hopefully some not worse <laughs> uh, if you're a staff member. The, the other thing, re remember we didn't all have cell phones in our pockets. Sure. So, you know, even, even the fax was something kind of new. We had what we call telecopiers. Mm -hmm. And the telecopier was a machine that sat on top of a filing cabinet Atlanta would call and say, we have a telecopy to send you. And I'll say, hold on, let me load the machine. You go get a single sheet of paper, open up a clamp, close the clamp on one end of the ship, turn, turn the cylinder, close the clamp on the other side of the sheet of paper, pick up the phone and say, okay, hit start. And you both hit start more or less at the same time. And the, the cylinder would turn like this and begin to smell because it was actually burning an image on there. It was, it was like photographic paper that got burned by heat or light. I don't know which it was, but it smelled. And then you'd get a sheet of paper, and when it was done, you'd unload that. And if they had two sheets of paper, oh my God, they, you'd have to take a second sheet of paper, put it on the clamp, turn the cylinder, put it on the clamp. Okay, hit start. Uh, well, thank God you were a newspaper man. You could you could well, uh, you operate well, it, this machine. So so you know it, things got a little better as time went on, <laughs> techno technological wise. But look, I was a guy who grew up sitting hand type. That's right. Helicopter was amazing. Yeah, that's right. The the I, I don't want to say none was demanding, but he was expecting. <laughs> let's 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 say that he he didn't demand something, but he expected it. And right. So we we. We hustled, I, right. I think would be a word to say. When he needed something, we hustled to get it. Um, the uh, other things were like, the thing that it's hard to explain in today's context yeah. is Nunn's goal was to be the best statesman he could be, not get on television as often as he could. Some of them, I think today, their objective is how much exposure can I get? The only real thing I'm trying to do is get exposure. Say what I have to say, do what I have to do mm. to get exposure, either on social media or television or whatever. But I remember when we started, uh, occasionally uh, we would do a live feed to Atlanta. WSB TV was mm -hmm. the most frequent one. The others did it some too. But it, it was tense because 
we would be on for, you know, 617. Okay, Scott, this WSB, your, your slot is at 617. Well, you know, any normal person would be down there at 6 o'clock at the WSB studios that were kind of near the train station, a little bit west between the Senate and, okay, yeah. and Union Station, but west of that. So it was four blocks, three blocks, something like that from the uh, Senate buildings, from the Russell building where the gym was. Mm -hmm. So none would leave the office and go by the gym to freshen up, clean up. He was about to be on television back home, you know, maybe even shave if he'd been up all day and it was six o'clock at night and stuff. But he would come out there and I would get him down to WSB, you know, at, at 6.15 for a 6.17 live shot. This is a live program. You got, you got a chair where Sam Nunn's gonna be sitting. Can you imagine the WSB staff, how tense they were waiting for none to get there. But there's no cell phone for me to say, look, I'm in the car, we'll be there in 60 seconds. I, I didn't have a way to do that. So they, they sweated bullets, I sweated bullets sitting outside of the Russell door that was closest to the gym that none would come out. We'd drive three miles and jump in and I'd, I'd run ahead of him and say, he's here, he's here. <laughs> and I know they were sweating bullets, but, yeah. but he, he was very cool, calm, and like, I got here on time. I, I had to sit here two minutes and wait. You know? <laughs> who, who was in charge of keeping his watch uh, <laughs> precise? <laughs> we, we needed to, and, and I don't think we ever missed one. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not complaining, but it, it was the lack of having a cell phone where you could assure yeah. somebody, we are going to be there two minutes before you go live. Don't worry mm -hmm. about it. Would have been extremely useful and helpful, but we, we did not have that. Right, right. You know? Well, you know, who, who else was working in the office and, and how much interaction did you as, as a deputy press secretary and later as press secretary have with Randy obvious, Knuckles, obviously the a, 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 LD? A, 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 the legislative director and his entire L.A. staff mm -hmm. be, because think questions would come into the office about those things. So I'd either have to get the answer from one of them or, or hook them up probably with the legislative director to talk, may, maybe background or something like that. Mm -hmm. But you kind of had to know what was going on in the office and what the big issues were. Right. Another job I had once I became press secretary was packing the briefcase for trips to Georgia. Now you think, well, that's a kind of a pedestrian thing. No, that was, that was <laughs> very good. You don't want Sam Nunn calling from Albany, Georgia, and saying, I don't have information I need, and I'm, I'm speaking tonight, or I'm going to see this constituent. And there's no so email, the, so you, the, can't, the, you can't just email. So, <laughs> so the, and, and, and eventually, you know, by the time I was press secretary in the, the late 80s, we had a little better technology. But the point would be is you had to anticipate how many stops he was making on the trip to Georgia what constituents in those areas had contacted us and how did we help them or not help them or mm -hmm. whatever, what key supporters there were going to be there, and then what current policy issues and often more specifically budget issues because mm -hmm. of the, all the military bases, they were often on his schedule, so you had to work with the Armed Services Committee to make sure he had files on that. And I you joke about sitting on the briefcase to get it closed. I sat on the briefcase to get it closed, <laughs> but you, you had to have everything he was going to need in right. the briefcase to, to send him home. And we did a good bit of that just when he was going home at night of what does he need to study at night. But it, it, amazed, it had just amazed me. We would stuff his briefcase and send him home at night, and he'd come down the next day. We'd unload his briefcase, and he has written red ink, on comments on everything in there. And so I'm like, when did he do it? When does he do this? I mean, <laughs> does he sleep? How does he do it? But, but again, you know, sometimes it might be a speech we had worked on or something that I have a lot of questions on that. Sure. Speech writing was, uh, I wasn't very good at it. And, and uh, he, he, it's hard to get inside his head the way he's thinking it and so forth. And, and what he just knows so much more than I ever knew that the, his edits and stuff would be stuff. Well, I, I, I didn't have a clue about putting that in there. I didn't, I didn't know that. But he'd talk to, you know, Senator John Warner, and he, he'd learn something, you know. He'd ask, quote, unquote, dumb questions until he wasn't dumb anymore. That's <laughs> I mean, he, he learned stuff because he wasn't afraid to explore 
uh, questions and stuff. Did you have much interaction with with the Senator Mattingly's staff, or, or, or was there any overlap there? Was that mainly in, in with Randy in the legislative shop? That, and, that was more legislative shop. Uh, when White Fowler was there, mm-hmm. Chuck Searcy was his press secretary for a while. Right. So Chuck and I were close to being with, uh, and, and so more so then, but to be honest with you, I you'd be shocked at how much, how close a relationship I'd have with John Warner, the Republican minority ranking minority member on Armed Services. Right. And and again, the, the way it worked out for me again, being in the right place at the right time, I became press secretary just before none, the Senate flipped and none became in the majority party instead of the minority party, and he became chairman of Armed Services Committee. Mm-hmm. That changes the, the whole world. Then he's getting invite, invited to Sunday shows, mm. uh, Meet the Press, This Week with David Brinkley, Good Morning America, uh, those kind of programs and so forth. But back to a point I made earlier about Nunn's objective was not to see how much exposure he get got. ABC News called me one time, just kind of informally, guy that I'd worked with there, and he, uh, he said, Scott, have we got a, has ABC got a problem with Senator Nunn? Is this, have we done something? I, I, don't, I forget the guy's name now, but I said, not that I'm aware of, but tell me more. <laughs> maybe, maybe we maybe. should. Have. Maybe we should. <laughs> he said, look, you turned down uh, the Brinkley show on Sunday. You turned down Good Morning America. Uh, we wanted to do an interview on something else, and you said no and stuff. Is, is he mad at us about something? And it was just like, no, he just, his objective isn't to see how much exposure he can get when he has thought something through and thinks he can contribute to the national debate on it. He'd be more than happy to do any of these programs and be glad to do it and want to do it. But he he likes to think about issues before just getting on TV and getting, you know, 12 million people, depending on the show at that time. 12 million is one of the numbers that sticks in my head for one of them. Uh, he, he'd, he'd easily pass on that because when he talked to 12 million people, he wanted to have something to say and <laughs> make sense and be logical and thoughtful. So he was one of the more thought of, thought, excuse me, sought after mm. interviews in the U.S. Senate because he was so thoughtful. He did put things together before he immediately responded. And I would, I, many occasions said, Senator, this won't be a story on Monday. He said, that's okay. You know, if it's not a story on Monday, it's fine. I haven't thought about it enough to go on television. Well, you know, you're, you're talking about the, the, the Armed Services Committee and, and his chairmanship, and, you know, that's obviously one of the main things that he's remembered for is chairing the, the Armed Services Committee. What was? How did you balance your work as, as press secretary for Senator Nunn and press, press secretary for Armed Services Committee? That's a good question, and when you figure out the answer, tell me, and I'll go yeah, back okay. and try to do it right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, the, 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 the best thing I did to balance that was hiring a, a deputy myself mm. named Bill Adams, who, who just to have help because right. it required help. Now, you have to understand, Nunn was chairman. Nunn kind of said, you, you do the Armed Services Committee, too. It probably would have made sense to have an Armed Services Committee press secretary and a personal press secretary. Yeah. But, but the Armed Services Committee, as you pointed out, Arnold Pernaro, who was chief of staff over there, had started out as kind of a deputy press secretary in Nunn's office. Mm-hmm. So he had some experience talking with the press. But more than important than being a press person was being knowledgeable about what, what was said and what wasn't said. And, and Arnold would, would have a security clearance in his position. He knew what he couldn't talk about what he could. We never gave, we never sought a security clearance for me because it would be easy for the press secretary to be pointed as, a, as the leaker if something got out that was classified. Mm-hmm. So I never got a classified security clearance and therefore could not go into certain meetings and so forth. And on occasion, not too many, but on occasion, just informal meetings, I'd be asked to get up and leave because the people in there were armed service staff members and, and senators 
and oops, we, we need to talk about some classified Scott, stuff. Scott, will you excuse us? Meaning, get, get out. But anyway, uh, it, it, was, it was better that, that I could never be accused because I'm, I never heard classified information. <laughs> uh, so it couldn't, it couldn't be me if, if anything got, got let out. Uh, so there were, the Armed Services Committee kind of, when it came to discussing issues with the media, they, they had the appropriate staff person mm-hmm. do it. And sometimes they did it on background. Sometimes you could do it for quotes or whatever. We kind of worked through what it was, how much we were pushing something to be in the news mm-hmm. as opposed to, you know, we, we don't have time to, to deal with any kind of thing. Uh, but I did an awful lot of setting up, talking to meet the press. Well, how long is he going to be on? Who else is going to be on the show? What else, what, what are you focus on? Because none's not going to do it if he's not prepared. Mm-hmm. And you know, if you can't tell me what we're talking about, we're not going to do it because none's going to be prepared before he comes. And, uh, you know, often I would meet Arnold at Nunn's house early on a Sunday mo- morning so we could go over what he was going to say on the program that day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we talked all of the press things about, you know, don't get distracted by obscure questions. These are the points that need to be made while you're on TV today. And we talk about some of that. These are the three points that no matter what questions you get, we got to make these three points, mm-hmm. you know, at the end of the question or whenever you can work it in. So we do some of that in the morning, but, but the Armed Services Committee staff would have memos and, and point papers and, and that stuff to him, you know, before the Sunday show, uh, you know, be great if you knew on Friday, but if not, it was Saturday or early Sunday morning. <laughs> what well, t- tell me, you know, in, in your experience with Senator Nunn, you know, in the minority party, majority party, what were some of the most memorable uh, events, pieces of legislation, hearings that, that you had to, you, know, you sat in on and had to, had to brief the press on or, or, or uh, chase the press off, so to speak, I guess? I think the m- most significant thing could easily have Nunn's name on it, but it's called the Goldwater Nichols bill. Mm-hmm. And Nunn worked really hard on that. Goldwater was in his declining mm-hmm. years. Uh, almost didn't, didn't run for his last term, but, it, but eventually decided to and mm-hmm. stuff, but didn't, didn't run for the next term. So I, I think maybe it was Goldwater Nichols came in his last year. Mm. None did much of the negotiations on that. The Goldwater Nichols bill reorganized military in the U.S. where it's, it's too complicated to explain in a few words and somebody like Arnold Panaro is the, who needs to explain this for, for posterity. But it, it basically uh, put more authority in the civilian control of the Secretary of Defense down through the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and then to the Service Chiefs. Before Goldwater Nichols, we had a big issue in, with services competing against one another instead of coordinating with one mm-hmm. another. Mm-hmm. And there were a lot of little details that went into that bill. But but those guys, Senator Nunn, his colleagues in the Senate, and the Armed Services Committee staff guys worked their tails off on that bill. I just remember it, it was just a huge, massive change in the whole thought process of Army competing with Air Force, uh, Air Force and Navy flying, who, who, who's flying and who gets what, and I don't want Air Force to get that jet because it might keep me from getting that jet. Mm. That, that kind of competition, and also in, in combat, you, you needed a, a co- much better coordination than we had with competing services who maybe wanted the glory or wanted the action or wanted the equipment and so forth. So, and, and at the end of that, and it's not for me to say, but my impression was none did more than half the work <laughs> to get that done, but it was none who said, let's call this the Goldwater Nichols bill from Nichols being in the house. Mm. Um, and, and because you needed to get it through bo- both things. Back to statesmanship, you name it for a House guy and a Senate guy instead of trying to get all the credit so you can get reelected, give credit where credit was due and, and none as, as a salute to Goldwater's long career in the mm-hmm. Senate. Let's, let's call it the Goldwater-Nichols bill and, and the other 
other statesmen in Congress went along with it and said, that's great. Yes, let's, let's, let's reward his long career by naming this significant piece of legislation after him. Well, something we mentioned briefly earlier in the, the interview was the, the, the run-up to the 1988 presidential election and all mm -hmm. the speculation mm -hmm. that, that was surrounding that. You know, as, as press secretary, were you involved in sort of the conversations? I, I, because I read the, the newspapers and did the research, you sure had to answer a lot of questions about presidential election and vice presidential selection and things like that. What, walk me through your experience and what you, what you remember about that 88 campaign. Well, one of the things you don't hear much about anymore is the Democratic Leadership Council. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I, and I'm not, again, the best one to talk about that, but it was a group of like-minded senators and, and Democrats who thought the party was moving too far to the left and that it was hurting re-electing chances and we need to be a little bit more moderate and focus on common values that the group had. And, mm -hmm. and you had Chuck Robb, who was former governor of Virginia and uh, at, at Clinton boy, you know. Yeah, you're uh, right. <laughs> yeah. uh, but whatever happened to him. Whatever happened to him. And, but there was a whole group of them, and they, they created a guy named Al Fromm mm -hmm. was the founder of it, and, and he, I think, is the one who pushed it and stuff, and a guy named Will Marshall was the policy guy, but, but they had this group of elected officials uh, who, who went around the country, and I went on one trip with none. We went to California, and I met Sally Ride, and uh, we, we went around and espoused that the Democratic Party would be more successful if it stopped quite leaning so far left, and, and not, not that you wanted to be Republicans, but you had, they, 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 they charted out, here's where we'd like to be, and here's where we think most Americans are. The middle way. More, the, more, the, of, the more than the middle, middle way. Uh, and to me, it still makes eminent logic that what we have is a far left and a far right fighting each other, and in the middle of looking around, where do we turn, where do we turn? I still think it was a, a good concept, and, and it's where we got Bill Clinton, who could be described as a more moderate Democrat than some of the others sure. that, that didn't get elected president uh, and so forth. So um, I, I think, get back to your question, is the DLC kind of was doing that, and I think I think most of the people involved were thinking either Clinton or Nunn would be the presidential candidate. And I think Nunn didn't know if it was the right thing for him to do or not. And I think Clinton had no doubts. <laughs> and, and, and I think that's why it turned out that way. Now the question is that we discussed earlier, would Nunn have been a good candidate? He would have been a fantastic president. Would he do? Would he follow up and not go to Iowa and not flip pancakes and all of the things and kind of in that category? How much of that would do and how responsive would people be to a guy who is dead serious about the problems we have, had thought through, can reason out solutions and so forth? Would be a tremendous, very effective president uh, versus somebody that oh gosh he did he did something silly or he you know he showed up at this place or he showed up that place. I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I did at one point when he kind of went around the room and asked what do y'all think, I did say the, the only thing that concerns me about this, I think he'd be a great president, is a lot of the media who's been so positive towards you will start looking to find your faults and they will, they will dig for faults in a presidential race and they're going to have editors that tell them, go find some dirt on Sam Nunn. And they they may have to you know fudge to get it, but they're gonna you know they're gonna have something that that's because none got very favorable press mm. for two for two reasons. One, he was a smart guy who who made good decisions and could explain those decisions, like he did with the vote on the Panama Canal Treaty, where most Georgians and this was before my time, but right. mo most Georgians uh, did not want to give away the Panama Canal. None sent out something like 
uh, I've always wanted to talk to Roland McElroy about this. It was like a six-page press release. Six but I was pages. I was working it. You'd never do that in journalism. <laughs> never. I was working at the Oval Club Records. I, I read all six pages. And I said, I don't know if he's right or wrong, but, but damn, he, he backs up everything he says. I mean, he, 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 he did the research. He, he'd quote admirals. He'd, co he'd quote generals. And he, he'd quote the logic behind it and stuff. And I just kept reading. It was, it was almost like, well, I understand. Well, I hadn't thought about that, you know, and you kept going. Mm. So, so he, he was a guy who was in debt and had the courage in his first term before he ran for before he ran for re-election the first time to do something that was not popular back home because it was the right thing to do for the country based on the research he had done mm -hmm. so so you you, I, you mentioned like the press coverage and I, I was looking for you know obviously there were some some negative press coverage in the 90s especially around don't ask don't tell yeah, and, yeah. And, and the Clarence Thomas um, nomination but I think the most negative press I found during your time as press secretary, was uh, auctioning off this farm equipment. Uh, he decided to get out of the farming business, and the press tried to make it. Uh, the newspaper tried to make it seem like that was part of the the, the big farm downturn and the, the farm crisis of the nineteen eighties. But that, that, far from that, I, I don't, I that don't remember a whole lot. That one doesn't stick with me as much as one that somebody got on the fact that he had, at one time, owned property that a defense installation was later built on mm. years after he had sold it to a relative. So Perry, Georgia, somebody <laughs> wants to, you got property, somebody wants to buy it, he happens to be a cousin of some distance, and you sell it to him. I think it was six years later they, they started looking for a place to put a defense plant down there, and uh, some people got on that, you know, none sold the property, which he did, to a family member, which a distant family member, which it was, but sometime he had the he he was six years ahead of that. It's it's like the time he got a, accused of joining the Coast Guard to avoid the Vietnam draft. So he, I forget what year it is, but he joined the Coast Guard about four years before anybody ever heard of Vietnam. <laughs> and you know anybody that prescient should get a little credit if you could figure out there's going to be a Vietnam War and I want to avoid it. I better join the Coast Guard now. He joined the Coast Guard, I think, mainly because his dad was ill, mm. and it, it allowed him to do military service, which he thought was appropriate, but it allowed him to be able to, to get back home more often and, uh, and, and kind of care for his dad in his later years. Sure. There was a lot of speculation in, in 1988 and in 2008 that, that a Senator Nunn might be Put on the, the the ticket as as vice presidential. Mm -hmm. uh, how seriously did did Senator Nunn take the the Dukakis campaign in 1988 when you were uh, when you were press secretary? Well, uh, that's an odd way to phrase it. How seriously did he take it? He, he you know, it was a, the can the candidate uh, was not in that mode that he later tried with the DLC to mm. to try to get into that that mode. Uh, he knew he wouldn't sell well back home. He he did, I think, make one appearance with him in, in Georgia, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's right. I think we have some photographs. You, you may you may have that, yeah. uh, as I recall. But I I don't think he looked at vice president. Oh, that's a step up. That's something I really want to do. Being a United States senator is is a pretty prime position. It has a lot of advantages over being. Uh, vice president. For one thing, you're not kicked out of office after four years. But, but anyway, it's true. Uh, and and when you're a U.S. senator, you can pretty much be your own man. When you're a vice president, you, you're trying to make the president look good. Right. And and so I think I'm not saying he would never have been vice president under any circumstances, but I think he he would have to know the presidential candidate and feel like one. We're, we're like this in, in our thought and our, and our approach. Uh, and that's one of the things none did never wavered on. He, he took his own approach the way things should be done. Not necessarily is this conservative or liberal or middle of the road or whatever, but there's a procedure, there's a process, there's a respect for the system and, and a respect for your constituents mm -hmm. and those kind of things 
that that he did his own way, and and you got you get less of that as a vice president than you do as a U.S. senator. Well, and and not to discredit or discount the senator's skill set, but making Mike Dukakis look good that seems like a full time job. Well, it, again, it, hard for none to do because he he's very uh, secure in where he needs to be. Yeah, and again, you know. You, you have to do some party things in politics. He, he was not great about doing everything the party wanted done. Sure. He, he, he was his own man and, and was true to himself, I think, which I, I can't tell today if they're all true to themselves even. Well, tell me about your, because we're getting towards the end of your, your Senate career. Um, tell me about your decision to, to leave um, Senator Nunn's staff and, and return to Georgia. It was pretty simple. My my wife and I had a, a baby in July. All right. And and, and I, I might as well, because you can always cut any stories that you don't want to hear. But we were talking about the caucus, and the the convention was in Atlanta. That's right, yeah. So I went down to Atlanta. My wife was two weeks before expected time to deliver our first child. Mm-hmm. I'm... I've set up with the Today Show okay. a tour of Perry, Georgia, focused on kind of the host U.S. senator, the host senior U.S. senator. He he, because none was well known, of course, at this time, and they wanted to put him into Perry, Georgia, and go look at things in Perry, Georgia, where he went to high school, and and those kind of things. <laughs> you know captain of the state champion basketball team, that kind of, you know, personality profile type thing. On the way to uh, the airport to meet the Today Show, they were going to fly us down to Perry and uh, do the show and everything. We had, I told you technology changed, Mm -hmm. we had a car phone, you know, it was in a big bag about like this, and you had to put it in the floor and put your feet over here because there was no room for it much and <laughs> put it in the floorboard and you had cords that plugged in and stuff. The phone rings and we we thought we were somebody having a car phone. I'll just tell you, we thought we were somebody. The phone rings and it's somebody from the hotel on no, no, uh, nun staff saying, your wife has called and she's gone to the hospital. Uh-oh. So we get, we get to uh, Peachtree Cab Airport mm-hmm. and we I introduce the NBC Today Show folks to Senator Dunn and Bill Adams, my assistant, had been in the hotel. They had sent him out to relieve me. So I had to introduce Bill, and Bill hadn't been involved in the negotiations of what we're going to see and not say, but Today Show had a, a, a list of what they were going to do. I said, Bill, they've got the list. Senator Nunn knows where all these places are. Just do the best you can. And the guy, the guy who drove Bill out to the airport, I got in the car and he drove me back to the hotel. I threw everything into a suitcase and got to the airport, thanks to Myra Crace Babrina, is, mm-hmm. is her married name, uh, who, who just looked at me and said, you will go. Well, I, I got to the airport. I was the last person to get on the airplane. I, I stood in one of the lines at Delta and I found a, a guy with a Delta uniform on, and I said, any way you can get me up, my, my wife's having a baby in Washington, I've got to catch this flight. And he said, oh, you've got time, you'll make it. I was the last person on the airport, and I ran through the airport with a suitcase in my hand. I got on the airplane, caught my breath, and I wrote a letter to my daughter who was about to be born. And in the letter I said, I ran through the airport like O.J. Simpson. Now, you won't know O.J. Simpson because he was a football player because none of the O.J. Simpson stuff had happened yet. He was a football player who did commercials right. running through the airport, if y'all have ever he, seen He those. was a Hertz uh, it, was it, spokesman. Was it Hertz? I think he was yet? Hertz spokes, spokesperson. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, he had this thing running through the airport to get his rental car or whatever. And I said, I ran through, and I said, you won't, you'll never have heard of O.J. Simpson because my intention was to give it to her when she was 16 years old. I don't know how I picked that, but that was my decision. So, with the plane lands, I call my wife. The hospital is sent her home, so that's that's good. Okay. I said, yep. how are you doing? She says, hurry. And I said, 
I'm at the airport, I can take a cab home or I can take a cab to the office where my car is still parked and then we'll have our have my car if we need it later. She said, go get your car, but hurry. I get home, her water is broken. Yeah. We, we get, I get her to the hospital and knowing me, I had had Lamaze training and it's gonna take 24 hours of labor or something, all these long stories. I said, is this a good time for me to get something to eat? God bless the nurse who said, why don't you wait till the doctor examines her and then we'll know what time you got. Doctor comes in and examine her, examines her and starts shouting at people. Says, she's fully dilated, you do this, you do that. Nurses who had been so calm and relaxed and told Jenny go in and change into this in the restroom without helping her at all. The baby was coming out and he looked at me and said, you go get your scrubs on. And I said, okay, where are the scrubs? And some nurse said, down in that closet in the hallway. So I open the closet, I, I put on I put on the scrubs, and then I see her wheeling, being wheeled down the hallway. So I'm running after her, and it's just like a comedy routine. You got these booties you're supposed to put on. I am take three steps and try to put it on, take three steps, try to get it on. Then I got the other one, take three steps. They, they turn left, oh, get, down, get, get my booties on. And I literally am, again, running like I did through the airport, chasing this trolley with my wife giving birth and, and the nurses hanging on stuff. And we swing through these open double doors and turn left and go through these open double doors. And we're there in a the room, open double doors, a lady's having a baby over there, open double doors, ladies having a baby over there. I understand it was one of the most baby delivering hospitals in America at the time. And they didn't close doors and people having babies everywhere. And literally we, uh, we, we got to the, we got to the hospital at 11.30 and baby's born at 12.10. Whew. Uh, but anyway, so that's my, my, my story. Back to your question, what caused me to leave? The baby was born in July. In about September, my wife was in law school. So she had a baby while trying on to law school. I was Sam Nunn's press secretary while he was chairman of Armed Services Committee. And I basically got to work at seven in the morning and would watch the first episode of national news before I felt comfortable to, to leave and go home. We, we didn't have time for a baby. Something's got to give. So, something's got to give. And we, uh, we decided it, it was just time to, to give it up and go home. Not sure Washington DC was where we wanted to raise a child. It was logistically difficult. And you know, you don't get rich as a staff person. And, Especially not for and, a Georgia, and, a Georgia senator. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I think in, in September I told Nunn I was going to leave in December to give him time to find somebody else, which they didn't do. But uh, anyway, uh, we, we moved, I moved my family back home at the end of the year. But then at the first of the year, the John Tower hearing came up. Mm -hmm. And Arnold Panaro called me and said, Scott, can you come back up here and help us? We hadn't, you know, we hadn't replaced you yet and we need somebody with experience. I think it'll be, you know, a couple of days one week and a couple of days the next week. <laughs> and I said, Arnold, uh, yeah, because I had gone to work again for the family interest in the printing business, mm -hmm. Greater Georgia Printers. But they had, it was a new position to try to expand into the sheet fed as opposed to printing newspapers business. So we hadn't really started it yet. Okay. So it wasn't like I needed to start in January. I could start in February, well, you know, yeah, whenever. whenever. So it was okay. So I told Arnold, if you'll pay to fly me home on weekend, because I've just moved my wife who's from Omaha, Nebraska to Georgia and you know, I got a new baby and I need, I just need, he said, fine, we'll take care of it. And of course, the John Tower hearing became very controversial. And I went, not every week, because there were weeks we didn't do anything, but I went back and forth uh, until April of that year with the John Tower controversy. And again, as, as people know, he was up to be, he was nominated to be Secretary of Defense and they ended up not uh, confirming him. And I think that's probably one of Nunn's most difficult times in the Senate because he was a former colleague. Yeah. The, the first day of the hearings, you know, all his daughters were there and he was talking to all the daughters and the family and everything like that until uh, 
people started making accusations against him. And the other thing that hurt was Nunn said, I've never seen him drunk before. Uh, he said, I, I've just never seen it. But it just, anyway, I, I, I don't want to denigrate anyone. It, it just got worse and worse and finally got to the point where none reasoning, I think, would be that he was in the, the line of, of command for atomic weapons. And we couldn't afford to, to him not being ready to be in that position. Right. And, but I think that was probably one of Nunn's most difficult times in the, in the U.S. Senate because it was a former colleague. And, that, and that's how we ended up with a, a little-known fellow named Dick Cheney who went on, yeah. went on, went on to, to, other, to things. Be, other things. Other things. Other things. Well, t tell me, how, how did you, you know, you went back to work for the family business, but as, as we said, and what you've been doing since 1997, uh, is working in, in government affairs, consulting, and lobbying. How, how, did, how did that come about? Well, I, I, did, I, I did what I went home to do, and that was kind of expand the newspaper printing business into dual, both newspaper printing and uh, commercial, regular commercial printing, mm -hmm. which is entirely different presses and right. processes kind of stuff. And I say, I, th that was what I was working on. We, we bought a small printing operation and went, went from that and kind of exp expanded it and, and so forth uh, and tried to get into a new market, which now as newspapers are going out of business, that, that was the right thing to have done all those years ago. Uh, but, you know, once you left the farm and seen Gay Paris, you, you get a little bored <laughs> when you go home. And I ran into Terry Matthews at the flower shop before Mother's Day in Athens one time. And Nunn had retired uh, at, at the end of 96, right, or the, right. the, the first week in January, whenever the, the time has gone. So uh, Terry had gone to work for a lobbyist in Atlanta after Nunn retired and I asked him how he's going and stuff. And he asked me how it was going and stuff. And I said, well, Charlie Harmon every now and then calls me and says, would you be doing in, interested in doing a little n news work for uh, a client, you know, uh, adjunct kind of thing. Just, sure, just yeah. take care of this little project for us and stuff. So I had talked to Charlie about that some. And I asked Terry, I said, your firm. He said, we just paid somebody an ungodly amount of money to put on a press conference. He said, if you'd be interested. Well, that conversation in the flower shop led to further conversation and Terry Matthews, God bless him, says, well, why can't we just do this ourselves? <laughs> well, I don't know. So we, we talked it through and we, just, we quit our jobs in, in July of 1997 without a client and printed up business cards and a brochure and said, we're in the lobbying business, governmental affairs consulting. Actually, we, we didn't at the time, we said public affairs consulting, and I was gonna do media stuff, and Terry was gonna do capital stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did early on, but it became increasingly clear to me that the money was in the lobbying thing, not in the press relations type right. end of it. And as social media began to develop, I didn't really pursue becoming an expert in that <laughs> because I was really looking at becoming more expert in the lobbying area because that seemed a more reasonable uh, financial situation. <laughs> and we, I mean, we literally borrowed money to pay ourselves a salary uh, when we started because we didn't have any clients. We had to go get them. But that was in 1997 and this is 2023 and it's still going. So you must, have, <laughs> you must have done something, right? Whew, we made it. Well, what was what was the experience, work work experience and insights that you gained from your time working in the the Senate? That that how did those transfer to to your life in in, in lobbying government affairs compared to what well, you've I, I kind of answered that a little bit earlier. Is what none taught was right. thoroughness, uh, I, 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 for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. and I I think I. Had, I think none promoted me because I had some writing skills. Uh, Roland McElroy had to come down to, to meet with all the field reps in, in Atlanta one time and he basically said, 
Soon to none wants y'all to read Scott's report and write him like he does. So anyway, that, that was my one little niche is that I could write a report or write a memo or stuff. Well, writing memos to clients is, is kind of what I do now is explaining to the client or explaining to a legislator or p communicating this is what we want or this is a situation mm -hmm. or whatever, basically communication skill. What, what none enhanced was the thoroughness of it of thinking down all the rabbit holes along mm -hmm. there that I might not have done before I worked for him. Uh, so uh, again, I, I credit that experience in Washington a, a great deal. So yeah, here in Georgia, our legislative session, as you will know as a, as a reading clerk, is, is 40 days. Um, you, and that's usually January to April, early April. What does a lobbyist do in Georgia between the months of May and December? That's a question we often get, and everybody makes the assumption, what a cush job. So I have been, this summer I've been to Savannah, Statesboro, Macon, Albany, Dalton, uh, no, not Dalton, Rome, Gainesville, and maybe some others to hearings that are being held by study committees and so forth. Mm, okay. I've, I've been to uncountable number of fundraisers for candidates and so forth. Uh, the, the issues, I have been to clients' annual meetings mm -hmm. in, uh, you know, uh, Jekyll Island, St. Simons, um, probably uh, Terry went to one that I didn't go up to on Lake Lanier. So we, 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 we take care of the client for one thing. You start building on what your client is going to need during the next session. Uh, I think this year has been maybe the busiest I've mm. had for study committees. Now those were, I mentioned, all around the state, but they have them in Atlanta more often than anywhere else. Sure. Now, Atlanta's a little easier to cover. Uh, there, there have been plenty of days when I, instead of going, I sat here in the chair and, and looked at the computer on Zoom because they were covered on Zoom and there's another one right behind it and sometimes they overlap. Right. Uh, I have spent a lot of time going to the archive of a study committee hearing and playing it through and saying five minutes, 22 seconds, they bring up this point. 12 minutes and 18 seconds, they bring up this point and then develop a memo to the client that says, here's the link. If you go there, move your cursor over to five minutes and 12 minutes, so-and-so talks about something that's important to the client. Mm. Then you can skip. I don't want the client to have to look at it for three hours. There's a three hour hearing. Right. There's some key points in that three hour hearing. So I'm, I'm, but it takes me a couple hours or at least an hour to go through and find here's what they need to listen to a minute and a half starting at 512. Then they can skip down to 13 minutes and look at another minute, two minute, three minute discussion so they get the gist of what was important to them. So not, not unlike what you said earlier of just condensing and distilling a whole lot of information and, and, and putting those takeaways that... that find, the, finding that, the takeaways and, and what affects this client. And, and you may you may do that for a client mm -hmm. and then you do it again for a different client, but there are different points that you have to point out. So client A gets, you know, three points at five minutes, 12 minutes and 13 minutes. B gets, you know, at seven minutes and 19 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, that happens sometimes, not often, but that, that has happened. Well, just as, as we wrap up, the last thing I always like to ask is what, what advice would you give young people, folks in college, students at UGA, for example, what advice would you give them about going into to government service today, which is a, a pretty cynical uh, age it, we live in. It, uh, it, but, it, but what advice would you give well, them? Well, I'd have to say it's not like it used to be, but maybe you can do something to ch make it more like it should be. And that merely being exposed via social media and you got on social media doesn't mean a whole lot mm. or it shouldn't mean a lot. It should be what you said, what you had to say, wh what you accomplished, what you can do. A uh, couple of things. One, 
It's, it's an amazingly interesting experience. It's like a continuing education class every day you go to work. Yeah. And, and that's kind of the way lobbying is, whether you're working on the staff of a member or you're working as a lobbyist working with staff and so forth. One of the great things about it, a lot like working at a weekly newspaper, is it's, it's continuing education. It doesn't really get dull and boring. You, you may get tired of it for other reasons, <laughs> but it's it's such an education. Uh, the, the other thing I, I think is what I've talked about before is exercise thoroughness. There, there's so many questions yet to, yet that you haven't thought to ask. Um, and the, the final thing is uh, a little bit tried, I suppose, but don't burn bridges. Yeah. People that you're mad at today may be your best colleague in the next issue that comes up. And sometimes when you're in the throes of a political battle, that's hard, hardest thing to remember is don't burn bridges. I think Senator Nunn was very good at not burning bridges with working across the aisle. Uh, I'll tell you one story. Uh, when, when Nunn was chairman and the Democrats had the majority, the Democratic version of the uh, national defense bill was going to win in mm -hmm. the Senate. I mean, you, you, got, you got the most votes, you're going to win, you know. But Nunn worked very closely with John Warner, the ranking minority member. Mm -hmm. Uh, they worked together. Warner one time saw me talking to his press secretary in the hallway one day. He said, you two, come in here. Now, he knows who I am. He knows I'm Nunn's press secretary. He brings us into the room, and Warner just asks us on an equal basis, what do you think is going, this is going to play if we do so-and-so and so-and-so? And so? He was interested in what Nunn's press secretary had to say, and his own press secretary had to say, how do you think it's going to play? Nunn and Warner tried to be statesmen about it. But anyway, to, to make my point, Nunn, they had the vote, Nunn won. He came back to the office from, you know, hours on the floor because the, right. that bill is complicated and, and big. Comes back and he tells Rose Johnson, his personal secretary, says, I want to play tennis with John Warner this week. Don't let him put you off till next week. I want to play this week. Nunn was about rebuilding didn't know of any bridge that might have been burned, but you know, it was a debate between their Republican version, Democrat version, so there was differences and stuff. <laughs> but he wanted to play tennis with John Warner to re repair anything that might have uh, gone gone south. And you don't see that today is all I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> when Senator Nunn wanted to give Senator Warner a chance, so he, he he wanted to play tennis instead of golf. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, golf would have been embarrassing. <laughs> he, what, well, Scott, thank you so much. Well, actually, is there anything else you know, I didn't ask or anything you would like yeah, to, yes, to say? Yes, one other thing to close. is more about none but mm -hmm. permanent subcommittee on investigations. Mm -hmm. When we talk about interesting stuff, none did some very interesting things with PSI mm -hmm. and... Uh, I think he deserves a lot of credit for some of the things he, he did. I, I think he deserves credit for hiring the people he, he hired to run armed services and to run PSI. Mm -hmm. And I think that served him well, but they, they were some of the brightest, sharpest, together people I had met. I often wondered, what am I doing here <laughs> if this, this is who the other staff guys are? Uh, especially on those committee staffs. Of course, when you're on a, a committee staff, you, you can attract the best, and, and none did attract very talented people. Eleanor Hill was the chairman of, uh, or excuse me, a director over at PSI, and, and I really respected her, and um, she, she went on to work again at the Pentagon and, and so forth. But again, it was a do things right attitude don't do things just to get news media attention or just to get press, do things the right way. And I think that was very important to, to mention that, that P, PSI was a big part of what he did and what things he accomplished there. Well, I, I, I agree. And thank you so much, Scott, for your time, your insights, you know, the benefit of your years of experience yeah. um, and taking the time out of, uh, out of this morning uh, to talk to us here at the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Um, Thank you so much. Pleased to do it.
look Good. forward to reading and seeing some of these other interviews. Uh, anytime, I'll, I'll send you the links. Okay, good. Great. Thanks, Scott.